Hello and welcome back to session three of our Bible study on fear. We've been talking about how God responds to fear, and so last week we heard Jesus speak to the disciples, Peace be with you. Today we will focus on how God shows his love for us, so that in the midst of fear we may be reminded of who he is and what he has done for us. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, these are trying times for people throughout the world, but we know that you have us in your hands. Watch over us and protect us. Guide us and open our hearts to your word during our time of study today. And we ask according to your will, your gracious blessing upon us. In Jesus' name, amen. I think reassurance is really necessary in our relationships. Maybe hearing something one single time just isn't always enough. Could be an assuring word, a popular one, I love you, between a husband and wife, or children and parents, or between friends. You probably would never think, well, I told them I love them once, that's probably enough. Why? Because it's not something you say just one time. You don't ration it. It's something you say over and over again, reminding them and allowing that word to ring in their ears yet another time. People need assurance. And during trying times like these, when people are so afraid, I think we see that need even more. Trying times bring out our need. Maybe today it's a loved one that needs to hear of a word of reassurance. Or maybe it's you. I think a lot of people need to be assured, especially, of who God is and what he's done. His love is present today as always and as it always will be. But when we're thrown into turbulent times in so many ways, sinful people need reminders. We need reminders because otherwise we will often dwell on the wrong things. On social media right now, I see it all the time. Is God punishing us with the coronavirus? Is this disease because of my sin? Did I not have enough faith? People are afraid. We're sinful, and that means sinful thoughts will creep into our minds. So sinful human beings are in need of real assurance constantly. Assurance and reassurance. And that's one of the things that God accomplishes for us in his word. He speaks his truth into our lives. Truth about us, about who we are, about the world in which we live, and truth about himself. And so today we will be reading a variety of passages from 1 John and also the book of Romans. We're going to read a few scripture verses together, and I'll put a slide up with them all together on the screen. It's kind of an outline of our human condition. Because we need to remember who we are and whose we are. And God tells us about both. 1 John 1.8 For if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Romans 3.23 For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 For the wages of sin is death. And Romans 8.36 as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So we're dead to sin. This truth is abundantly clear in scripture. And I think it's even clear in our experiences every day. During hard times, maybe you dwell on those experiences. But we need to see the whole picture. There's more to it. It may not seem like it at first glance, but each of these passages tells us something about the love of God, at least when we read it in context. When you read the scriptures, you need to read the whole story, the whole picture. In my Bible studies, I always emphasize the importance of context. The context matters because we want to read and understand what the Word of God is actually saying. All of those verses are 100% correct. They're all right, they're all the word of God, 
and the diagnosis is correct. But we have to read more because we have to read all the words. And we have to read in light of Jesus. Because as sinful creatures, we need reassurance in our human relationships, but also in our relationship with God. So today we're going to read and reread those verses we just read a moment ago, as well as a couple others, to see just how powerful the love of God is. We will start in 1 John, and then we'll move on to the book of Romans. So look again at 1 John chapter 1, once again, verses 8 through 10. Some of you may recognize these words from confession in church. Some churches speak these same words each week as their confession. Confession is a time when we turn to God and say, I'm not what you made me to be. I don't live according to your will. The word confess means to say the same, and that's exactly what it is. When God tells us about who we are, confession is agreeing with him. We say, you're right, God. And that goes both for our sinful condition and for our new life, our forgiveness, our salvation. We say the same thing because he's right. 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10, one verse at a time. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So yes, but we don't stop there, right? We read on to verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the result. Being in a relationship with God, which is an act of mercy to begin with, is a gracious thing. He didn't accept us because we're just so perfect or because we confess our sins so well. He gave us those words to say. He gave us those words of love and of reassurance, fully undeserved. And so, yes, we say, God, I'm sinful. But he gives you better words to say, forgiveness words. He says, you're forgiven, and you get to say that now, too. Verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I think we leave out verse 10 too often. This really puts it quite plainly. Confession is saying the same thing. And if we say we haven't sinned, we're disagreeing with God. He's saying one thing, we're saying the other. There's no hiding sin from God. He knows about it, and he's told you about it. He gave you those words. So there's no need to lie about it. There's no need to be prideful and claim innocence. No matter what's going on in your life, be reassured. Your God has a desire to show mercy in love. Let's go further into 1 John to chapter 4. We're going to read verses 7 through 19, where we hear a little bit more about the specifics of that love of God. Let's start right by reading up to verse 12, and then we're going to continue on from there. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. So love is from God. He is the source of love, and we see that in so many ways. To start, he created not by necessity, but by his own will. He created, and he promised redemption when that creation fell into sin. We just heard about that in the last passage. 
And it's through that redemption that we see the love of God so clearly. Verse 9 said it, The love of God was made manifest among us. And where do we see that? It's in God's Son, who was sent into the world, and who has brought us life in Him. Love is something that comes from God. It has to. Verse 10 even shows us that contrast. It contrasts our love with God's love. And how do they compare? They're completely different on every level. While our love is wavering, it's selfish, God's love is unwavering, seen in his self-sacrifice for our forgiveness, loving the unlovable. All right, let's read verses 13 through 19. We'll continue. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected in us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. So the reassurance continues. Not only is God the source of love, but we abide in God and God in us. And we're given a few reasons why we know that, why we can be completely sure that God abides in us and that we have his love. First, and we've talked about this one, he's given us of his spirit. And that's a sure thing. In a personal way, God abides in us by his spirit, giving us his life. How else? Because the Father sent the Son to be the Savior. The Father, the Son, the Spirit, all at work. The Trinity is at work. We are given the Spirit, the Father sent the Son to be the Savior, and that Savior, whoever confesses his name, the name of Jesus, God abides in him and he in God. There. Three ways to be sure that we have been given the love of God, which means that God dwells in us. We have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Spirit. So no matter what's happened in your life, be reassured. God in Trinity has shown his love through his eternal plan to save. Let's move on to looking at our passages from the book of Romans. You'll see some themes in these passages about justification. When we get to chapter 5, you'll see the connection between the love of God and justification in what is one of my favorite passages in the scriptures. So let's start in Romans 3. We read, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A lot of people are familiar with those words. But are you familiar with the words that come just after? Again, we read in context. So what does it say in full? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. For all have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but in order to remedy it, he's taken it upon himself to resolve the problem himself. 
All have sinned and fall short, but they are justified by grace. To be justified means to be made righteous, or to be made right with God. It's about that relationship being repaired. The saving act of God in the life of a sinner. That means you are justified. And that hasn't changed. You were made and declared righteous with God, even though you've fallen short on your own. He has made us sinners righteous by grace. This is what grace looks like. And yes, we still sin. Yes, we have need to repent and confess, as we talked about earlier. But what is God's response? It's not to reject us. It's to show his love by justifying the sinner. He shows love to us. I think we need that reassurance sometimes. I think we hear something similar in Romans 6. After we hear the wages of sin is death. Here's what we hear. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm of the opinion that you can't hear the gospel message enough. That's why we will always preach the gospel. The gospel tells us about the love of God. The love of God that really is amazing. It thrives in an inhospitable environment. As broken as it is, look at it today. This world of sin, it was breached by the incarnate Son of God, the Savior. And so if you really want to see the depth of the love of God, where do you look? You look to the places he promises to show his love. So no matter what will happen in this life, be reassured. Jesus has restored your relationship with the Father, and you have been declared justified, righteous. And now you have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Let's move on and head to Romans chapter 5. This chapter contains some of my favorite scripture verses. You know, people often go to John 3.16 to summarize the gospel, which is a fantastic passage. But throw Romans 5 in your bank of scriptures. It's a great way to express the love of God. Romans 5 verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So here's the explicit connection between justification, how you're made righteous, and the love of God. I especially want to focus on verses 5 through 8. By grace, through faith, we have justification that brings peace with God. Now first I want to point out that Paul doesn't promise that all sufferings will stop just because you're justified. Your relationship with God is repaired by Jesus the Son, yes, but he says that sufferings will continue. 
And in verse 3, he takes it a step further. His outlook on suffering changes as one who is made right with God. It's bold, but he says we rejoice in our sufferings. Joy in suffering? Now, I think Paul certainly doesn't like suffering, but his outlook has shifted. Justification changes things. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope doesn't put us to shame. Why? Because of the love of God poured into our hearts, that justification changes things. Now look at verses 6 through 8. I'd really encourage you to memorize these verses. God works through his word, and in his word he tells you about the love of God. He tells you that though we were still weak, even dead in sin, Christ died. And for whom did he die? He died for the ungodly. Not because we deserve it, not because we impress him, but why? Because it was the right time. The right time for God to show his everlasting love, and he did. How does God show his love? Here's those verses. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ entered our world of death in order to die himself all on behalf of unrighteous people and to make us righteous. The love of God really is far different than our love. It's everlasting. It's love that is for all in Christ Jesus. So no matter the difficulty of whatever you're going through in life, be reassured of this. We see God's everlasting love for us in his self-sacrifice on the cross while we were still sinners. Now that brings us to our final passage for today from Romans chapter 8. You can turn to verses 31 through 39. For your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. You may recognize those words. They showed up in our church readings not too long ago. Actually, they aren't Paul's words. They're from Psalm 44, verse 22. When I visit someone who's enduring hardship, I often go straight to the Psalms for words of comfort. Why? Because the words of the Psalms are often easy for people to identify with. They're really honest. And here are some honest words from a difficult circumstance. For your sake, we, and who's the we? It's Old Testament believers here, we. They were being put to death, regarded as simple sheep whose sole purpose was to be led to the slaughter. They were in the context of death and persecution. It was serious. And it wasn't right. They weren't meant to be killed like that. They're God's people. But it happened. And it really is hard to sugarcoat a tough truth like that. And yet here, Paul cites these words to show the love of God. He's written chapters and chapters expressing the great mystery of justification by grace, through faith, freely in Christ. And then he says these words. Verses 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. 
No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Psalm 44 is describing a very difficult circumstance. So by drawing from Psalm 44, Paul shows us just how powerful God's everlasting love really is. The power of God's love is this, that nothing can take us away from him. The love of God is seen in Christ on the cross. And who can take us away from that? And because of Christ's work on your behalf, you're called God's own, his justified, made righteous by his blood. Who can accuse you? You're justified. Who can condemn you? Who can separate you from salvation in Christ? No one. No fear. No virus. And any other power pales in comparison to God's love. This is the love of God that springs into action on your behalf. The love of Christ passes all human understanding, and so nothing can take it away, even in the context of a sinful world. Even in the context of death, of persecution, of hatred, of division, whatever it is. We don't know the future. The circumstances may be different, but what's unchanging is God's love shown through it. Through all of these things, we are more than conquerors, but not on our own. It's through Christ who showed his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, he died for us. Thank you very much for joining me today. I'm excited for the day when we can gather again together safely and study the scriptures together in person. Until then, we will continue doing so how, however we are able. And through it all, be sure of this. God's love for you is unwavering. This week, if you'd like to do some additional devotional reading, which I'd really encourage you to do, feel free to look at the following passages. Romans 8, 1 John 3, 19 to 24, Hebrews 2, verses 9 through 18, 1, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. God be with you in your devotion. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, people are scared for so many reasons. For their health, for their loved ones, for their countries and the whole world. Lord, according to your will, bless all those serving us in their many vocations, including all medical personnel and all who work on behalf of the public, and all who are struggling with unemployment or underemployment. Equip all those in positions of power to provide aid for those in need. And Father, guide us all at Emmanuel that during this strange time, we would be reminded and reassured of your love. Keep us safe, Lord, and draw us closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen.